Good morning. Welcome to Men of the Word, a men's ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland right here in Fort Valley, Georgia. Our church is located about three miles west of Interstate 75 on exit 142, which is Georgia Highway 96. I'm your host, Greg Cannington, and I will be uh, with you today as we do an overview of the book of Galatians prior to getting into a full study. Here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, if you've not been with us before, we teach the Bible. That's our doctrine. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, skipping nothing. And we believe both the Old and the New Testaments are required reading for the Christian. And that's what we do. Give you an example. If you're watching online today, we're in the New Testament, and we've gone through several of the book letters written by the Apostle Paul, and we're about to start the fourth, which would be Galatians. But we, but our Sunday service is also in uh, the New Testament with Senior Pastor Jerry Axtell. He's been teaching in the book of Acts as we we're getting close to the end there. And on Wednesday night, Pastor Phil Snyder has been leading us in a study through Deuteronomy, which we started two years ago with Genesis. And we're just about to finish up Deuteronomy, and we'll go right into the book of Joshua, which is the conquest of the Holy Land uh, by the Israelites. By studying the Old and the New Testament, the New Testament contains such great, great, promises from the Lord God. It's the whole Bible, the whole Holy Scriptures is a love letter to God's creation, people. And you'll find when you do, and especially with Paul, he quotes a lot, he quotes a number of Old Testament, because that's the only scriptures he had at this time. But he emphasizes God's promises. God doesn't change. His promises will never change. If he promised it, it's happening. There are conditions, of course. We believe that studying the Bible is, re is needed for all Christian men and women and children. It contains everything we need as guidance, raising children, how to love your family, love your wife, how to love your God, and how to treat people. It's all a love letter from beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation. Three of our ministries, like the one you're watching today if you're online, is put on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. The first one being our Sunday morning service with Jerry Axtell, as I mentioned, Pastor Phil on Wednesday night. Those three are online. So, while we'd love to have you visit us, we'd love to meet you. If you're in the area or you live around here, come out. And we'd love to see you. But if you can't or you miss one, it's online so you can catch up. Even if you come in late in the study, you can find them, start at the beginning and, and listen to them all. Open your Bible and read along and ponder the words of the Almighty God. We have other ministries that aren't online, such as our Student Misfits Ministry for middle school and high schoolers, led by Paul and Jenna Berger. They meet on at 6 p.m. every Friday. And there's two ladies studies. We actually started back up to this morning, the 19th of September. They've been on a hiatus over the summer, but there's a morning and an evening study. In addition, there's a, another Men of the Word evening study on alternate Tuesdays, the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. And that's with uh, Aaron Glaze, Pastor Aaron Glaze, and his team. We're currently in this, the book of Second Chronicles. All great studies. So you see, this old in the New Testament, we do it all. That's our doctrine. Because we believe here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, 
That's all we need. Fellowship, prayer, studying God's Word, living God's Word. So if you're interested and you want to go and see what our schedules are and our activities, for instance, this week we'll have a, a men's conference starting this Friday, go online and look up cchga.org and you'll see all of our ministries listed with times and that sort of thing and other activities. So before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who you are, Lord, and all that you've done for us. We see your hand at work and we lift up praises to you in thanksgiving for your grace, Lord, and your mercy towards us and what you've done and what you're going to do, for your promises are true. Your word, Lord, your holy word in these scriptures give evidence to who you are, your faithfulness throughout. And as we lift up these praises of thanksgiving to you, Lord, and as we gather together today to open your word, we pray the Holy Spirit will be with us to guide us and open our hearts to a better understanding and to the deeper meanings contained therein. We desire, Lord, with all our hearts to draw near to you and to be conformed to the image of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. If you were with us last week, Paul, the Apostle Paul closed out 2 Corinthians and he stated he preferred to come gently, not bull in a china shop or not pointing out everybody, but there were those that were not, they were disturbing the people, they were criticizing, that sort of thing. They were a minority, apparently, but they were still there. And isn't that funny that the vocal minority also always stirs up stuff when it doesn't need to be? Doubters, that was one of the punk. They were saying, oh, Paul's not a, a true apostle. He doesn't do all this, everything that we would expect. Well, there's a good point there. God doesn't choose people by how they look. He chooses people by what they have in their heart and what they're capable of doing and in their weakness. Paul talked greatly about that in the weakness of the person. When we're weak and rely on God, His strength can do things that we could never even consider. And that's the way God designed it. That's the way it is. So as we get into that, I think it's um, important to talk about a little bit about the background. So when, you're, when we're studying this book of Galatians, and it's not a long book, it has six chapters. It's not terribly long. It's not as long as, say, Corinthians, which had 13, 2 Corinthians had 13. But it's some very key points, and I'm going to point those out. But first, we're going to talk about the... Uh, when was this written? Well, the blessing is we have the book of Acts written by Luke the great physician, as Paul called him, who was eyewitness to many of these things. And he wrote a very detailed uh, documentation of the journeys, the people in the early church. And because of that, we can pinpoint pretty, gent pretty good about when certain things occurred. Um, for instance, Acts 15 mentions that Paul attended the Jerusalem Council. And that's where there were some disagreement on people who weren't Jewish being saved. Could they be saved? And the evidence of it, the baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, was on these non-Jewish people. So the, one of the things the Jerusalem Council did said, hey, all we, if you, you can be saved and if you have the Holy Spirit, who are you? we? Yet there were people out there in the churches trying to get saved you're not saved unless you become a Jew first. And then you can become a Christian. Not true at all. And not, not at all what the Jerusalem Council said. 
So most scholars put the Jerusalem uh, Council at about A.D. 49. Galatians was written a short time after the uh, Council of Jerusalem, approximately A.D. 49. So most scholars also believe that this was written to the churches in southern Galatia. Now, there's a reason for that, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. And as to be expected to of all of God's word, Paul writes to a particular church, or particular, in this case, a group of churches in Galatia, the Roman province. But did it stay there? Of course not. That's why we have it in our scriptures today. It spread. All of these letters that Paul wrote, and others, of course, didn't stay because God's, that's how God's word is. It's alive. And we have it today. And there's extremely good documentation that what we have is exactly what was written. Isn't that wonderful? And who wrote it? Are we sure Paul wrote it? Yeah, because that was it's been handed down and it was by his hand. And there's, there's actually other contemporary authorship says, yes, absolutely, the Apostle Paul wrote this. Apostle uh, Acts 15, as I mentioned, where it talks about the Jerusalem Council, Paul attended it. He was one of the main people there. And there's no evidence that Paul went to northern Galatia until after the Jerusalem Council because the churches he founded were in the southern part. And I'll talk a bit about that in the next little few statements. But there's no restriction. While he wrote it to these four churches primarily, when it was written, it spread throughout Christendom. And through his people knew who Paul was and wanted to hear what he had to say because it's genuine revelation from the Lord God Almighty. You know, in Paul's day, the word Galatia actually had two meanings. Ethnically and the Roman province. The term Galatian really refers to a part of Asia Minor. That's all of Galatia, really, part of it present-day, modern-day Turkey, and it was inhabited by ethnic Galatians, which were Celtic peoples that had migrated from Gaul, present-day France, in around the 3rd century B.C. The Romans conquered these Galatians in 189 B.C., and they had some independence until about A.D. 25, when they were incorporated into this Roman province governed by a Roman governor of Galatia. So in his time, it could be used in several ways. The ethnic Galatians, which are primarily in the central and northern part, or all of, for the ethnics, and all of Galatia, speaking of the Roman province. We do know that from Acts, that in southern Galatia, Apostle Paul founded a church in Antioch. Now, don't be confused. There's more than one Antioch in the ancient world. Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe during his first missionary journey, which is con that information is contained in Acts 13, verse 14, and Acts 14, verse 23. So there's no evidence that prior to the Jerusalem Council that Paul ever went to the north, but he certainly went to these places. See how these things tie together? And that's important. And it's been great that our senior pastor, Jerry Axtell, has been leading us through for the last couple of months in the book of Acts, because all these things, as we're studying Paul's epistles, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, and now about to start Galatians, all these things fit together. That's because God wrote it, God's words. He's, he's still on the throne. He was on the throne then, and, way, and before the beginning of time, he's on the throne now. <clears throat> 
So it would appear to most scholars, and I, this is what I also believe, that it was written to these specific four churches because of the timing, as I said, because of the subject matter that Paul's going to discuss. And there were people that weren't following what the, the church headquarters, to say another word, the church, the, the Christians in Jerusalem and all their uh, missionaries came to the conclusion, yes, this is not just for Jews. It's for all of mankind, for the Greeks as well. And you see a lot of that because in the, these areas were primarily in the Greek culture. And by God's design, the word spread. The epistles that Paul wrote also are spread. And we have them intact, exactly as they were written, translated into English, if you're an English like we are, American English, and other languages. But it's the truth. It's exactly what happened. Now, why did Paul write this book? It's to confront these Judaizers, as they're known, spreading false doctrine, not the gospel that was being preached by Paul and other eminent uh, missionaries, Apollos, Peter, and others. Because these Judaizers said, oh, a new believer in Jesus must become a Jewish proselyte and submit to the Mosaic law before they can become Christians and be saved. This was completely contrary to the instruction that came out of the Jerusalem Council. Yet there were those out there spreading it, wanting everybody to be a Jew first, because only the Jews can be saved. Well, that is not what Scripture says. That's not what the prophets said all through the history of Israel and later when they were conquered. The prophecies was for all men, not just the Jews. The Jews were to be the example to draw people to God, which they didn't always do. They frequently did not. The problem that Paul addressed in the church in Corinth was also an issue with the Galatians. He wrote this epistle because of the principle of justification by faith. Faith. There was no Jewish religion in Abraham, but the scripture's time, but the Bible says Abraham was justified by his faith in God. The same is true here. And he warned the Galatian churches that they could not abandon this central doctrine that was confirmed at the Jerusalem Council. This was the leadership of the early Christian church. And Paul in this letter also addresses his qualifications as an apostle. Apostle. He was frequently criticized and, we, and challenged. And as we read in our studies through First and Second Corinthians, he points it out. And the way he does it is marvelous because he always asks the questions, did I not? Did I not? So the answer is to these, well, of course you did. Well, those are my qualifications. I also would point out that Paul was converted in a moment by his encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was struck blind. That's Jesus appointed him and selected him just as much as he did when he selected his 12 disciples. Except this was the risen Lord. The Lord, the Lord who had paid the price for sin. To which Paul, for all his epistles, he talks about, you know, I'm the worst. What I did. But he, was, he knew he was forgiven. There's some interesting things about this book as well. This is where we know a little more information that wasn't contained in the book of Acts, such as in chapters 1 and 2 of Galatians, first of Paul's stay in what was known as the Nabataean part of Arabia for three years. 
Also his visit, or 15-day visit with Peter after this time in Arabia. And that's contained in Galatians 1, 18 and 19. And his trip to the Jerusalem Council, Galatians 2, 1, and his confrontation with Peter in Galatians 2, verses 11 through 22. So you see there's, this confirms a lot of things we know about Paul in addition to what Luke wrote in, in Acts. This, these things just fit together like cogs in a, a transmission. The gears all mesh together, all this information. And the major theme within this book of Galatians, there is only one gospel. And Paul writes in Galatians 1, verse 8 and 9, but if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be cursed. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. He repeats it. Now it's interesting in the book, studying the book of Deuteronomy, before Moses died, and he's given instructions, and he says, if you don't do these things, you will be cursed. If you don't follow God's principles, you will be, you'll feel, get the uh, results. God won't bless you. You won't get the blessings he promised because you're not doing what he told you to do. If you do these things, you'll be blessed beyond measures. Paul is saying the same thing. If you're preaching the wrong gospel, then you are, you're accursed. There's another important point in this book that the law, meaning the law of Moses, is our schoolmaster. It can't save us, but the law is still the law. That's God's standard. But what it does, it shows us no person can fully keep it, which is exactly why we need a Savior. It doesn't invalidate God's standards. These are God's standards. Now, Jesus is the only one who is able to uphold it. So what would happen to us if we didn't have a Savior? We would be guilty in God's eyes, but if you're saved, you're not. And he writes about this in the chapter 3 of Galatians, 10 and, verses 10 and 12. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. And he continues in verses 23 and 24, But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, except for the faith which would afterward would be revealed, revealed through Jesus. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, to show us the need that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we no longer are under a tutor. Another principle he talks about in this book is liberty and walking in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast before the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled with a yoke of bondage. I say then, in verse 6, Walk in the Spirit, and you will, shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you were led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. 
In other words, these are the things that do not violate the law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh in its passions and desires. If we live by a spirit, let us walk in the spirit. So that's just the highlights that we look to look forward to. And if you, you probably heard some of these if you've been in Bible studies before, and it's a good thing to go over them again and dig a little deeper. That's what Bible study does. So my friends, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, do so now. It's the most important decision you will ever make because your decision determines your destiny for an eternity. Accept God's free gift of grace and forgiveness of your sin because Jesus paid for that sin upon the cross. And the Apostle Paul wrote very eloquently about what it would take. He writes in Romans 10, verses 9 through 13, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. You could also say the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's all it takes. And you'll have the assurance from God by the presence of the Holy Spirit within your heart once you become a believer. And you will be saved. And if that's you, welcome to the kingdom of God. I urge you to find yourself a Bible teaching, Bible believing church and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thanks to my brother Kyle behind the camera, who records, edits, and puts our video ministries on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Join us again next week as we continue our journey in the New Testament with Paul's epistle to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. And we will start our study with chapter 1 next week. God bless you and may God keep you in his tender mercy.